on this edition of the Fifth Estate. In New Brunswick, it was the trial with everything. A confluence of celebrity, money, and murder. They are very prominent, very well known, and very powerful. A beer company dynasty. A father bludgeoned to death. At the end of this investigation, we'll find that the, the perpetrator and the victim uh, knew each other. Accused of the brutal killing, the victim's only son. He brought this on, pushed you, pushed you, pushed you, squeezed you, rubbed your face in the fact that he controls it all. I thought it was uh, preposterous. The Dennis Olin that I know is just simply not capable of uh, such a horrific act. In a small city, would connections and influence trump justice? There seemed to be an attitude in the city that, you know, uh, he's, he's going to walk away. And how did the August Olin family saga become a whodunit? And the man had his life brutally taken from him, and the killer's still at large. For all we know, nobody's looking for him. I'm Bob McEwen in St. John, New Brunswick. This is the Fifth Estate. It was as select a gathering as you're ever likely to find in Atlantic Canada. The rich, the politically powerful, the social elite, with names like Irving, McCain, and Oland. Brought together outside St. John, New Brunswick on a summer day in 2011 by tragedy. The death, in fact, the murder of one of their own. Maritime royalty with a fortune built on beer. 69-year-old Richard Oland, known to his friends as Dick. There are three really powerful, all powerful families in New Brunswick, the, the Irvings, the McCains, and the Olands. Author and journalist Stephen Kimber says the Olands, like the others, have been ubiquitous throughout maritime history to this day. They permeate every aspect of society, political, business, uh, philanthropic. I mean, what, whatever you want to say, they are, are part of that society and have been for generations. The Dick Oland his peers came to remember it was not only the successful businessman. He was also a philanthropist who hobnobbed with prime ministers and with real royalty. He could well afford an affluent lifestyle. Enthusiastic skier, avid fisherman, world-class sailor whose pride and joy was a new $850,000 racing yacht. A member of the Order of Canada as a community leader. Now the president of the Canada Games, Richard Oland. Among his many local projects, shepherding the Canada Games to St. John. We have made these games the best Canada Games ever and the legacy of sports facilities that endures to this day. You know, from a business perspective, uh, Dick was, was brilliant. You could tell it uh, from a financial aspect. Uh, numbers really spoke to him. When businessman Dale Knox joined the Canada Games Foundation, he was exposed to Dick Olin's forceful personality at his first board meeting. And I had a question, and it was uh, a question around some of the you know, financial stuff. And Dick didn't like my question. And it was basically, you know, you talk when I tell you that you can talk. And, of course, I didn't take that very kindly. And uh, after the meeting, he comes over and he says, um, you're going to be a great addition to the, this board, puts his arm around my shoulder and says, we're going to do great things. And I walked out and I thought, okay, what just happened? And Dick Oland also seemed to have a love-hate relationship with the family business, brewing beer. The Oland Brewery was founded in the mid-19th century, the same year as Canada started by matriarch Susanna Oland, an entrepreneur and businesswoman far ahead of her time. Several decades later, her descendants launched the iconic Moosehead beer brand. Cheers. Cheers. It's been run by generations of Olands ever since. It is very family-like. We work together for one cause, and that's to make great beer. But in 1981, 
a falling out in the family, when Dick Olin's father picked his older brother to take control of the company. A public humiliation, according to writer Stephen Kimber. His father was a bit condescending, even in public, to uh, Richard and, and said that he, you know, he wasn't ready, he wasn't uh, advanced enough to, to take on this job. And if you, if you think about all the things that have happened since, that's the, the moment I would go back to and say that's when many things began to happen. And just as Dick couldn't seem to please his father, he could be especially hard on his son Dennis, a teenager when his dad lost control of the family business. His relationships with his children changed after he left Moosehead. He was much more difficult to, to deal with, and it seemed to particularly affect the son, Dennis. Politely put, Dick Oland was not an easy man, described by one of his daughters as someone who could make an enemy of anyone. A business associate said to know him is to dislike him. But there was something else at play between Dick Oland and his adult children. He was having an extramarital relationship with a local real estate agent, Diana Sedlicek. It had gone on for eight years, but he had apparently never told the truth to Connie, his wife of almost five decades. For their kids, it was a very sensitive subject. But here in St. John, so much more of the Olin's family affairs would soon be on public display. Because as you're about to see, what happened next would embroil, intrigue, and shock the city, the province, and the Maritimes for years. And it would all start coming to light at number 52 Canterbury Street, at the office of Dick Olin's Far End Investment Corporation. It was the morning of July 7, 2011. As usual, Olin's assistant arrived for work before 9 a.m. Unusually, she found the front door unlocked. When she took the stairs to his second floor office, nothing would ever be as usual again. At the top of the stairs, there is another door that is also always kept locked, but seems to be open suddenly. So she's you know, puzzled by this. She enters and she's greeted by you know, what is a horrific sight. Immediately, the police descended on Canterbury Street. In the heart of sedate St. John, it was obvious something was terribly wrong at Dick Olin's office. Larry Kane is a family friend who works nearby. I think the police presence down in front of the office became you know, very substantial, and uh, news started to, to leak out that Dick had been murdered. And, and I have to tell you, I was in complete shock. It just doesn't happen in this community. But the tale told by the crime scene photos is so much worse than they could imagine. Preliminary results of the autopsy, coupled with the evidence at the scene, clearly indicate that Richard Olin was a victim of foul play, homicide. Dick Olin had been bludgeoned to death with a hammer-like object, a vicious attack inflicting more than 40 wounds in his neck, hands, and head, including 14 skull fractures. The body lay next to his desk, surrounded by blood, and brain tissue. I was frankly stunned, as I'm sure that was everyone's first reaction. Olin neighbor and friend Kelly Patterson says the response everywhere was disbelief. Did this make sense? Was it plausible that someone would want to murder him? I couldn't imagine why. I, I can't imagine uh, why he would be an obvious person <laughs> if someone in St. John's going to be murdered. He would be the last person I would think of. But imagine it or not, Dick Oland was dead. Business leader, community benefactor, family icon, killed in the most brutal way. Now only two questions mattered. Who did it and why? The day the body was found, Oland family members came to police headquarters to give statements to investigators. You can just have a seat right there. Right? His only son, Dennis arrives about 6 p.m. to speak to Constable Stephen Davidson. Been a long day, huh? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I, I know we met before, but I'm Constable Davidson. Okay. He had been told just hours before that his father had died suddenly, but apparently given few other details. From the beginning, Dennis seems relaxed, even talkative. 
Yeah, well, the biggest thing that's on my mind is, is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty clear in my head that he, he didn't have a heart attack and die. Something's happened to him. Mm -hmm. and but Dennis doesn't directly ask how his dad died, you know, so instead offering a theory. Dance. You know, it was just one of those, uh, you know, crackhead type things or whatever where someone goes in and you know does that kind of thing or you know like sort of being in the wrong place at the wrong time mm -hmm. do you have anybody in mind that would come to mind uh, to you um, as being involved in this and he's got a suggestion about a possible suspect his father's mistress diana sedlicek the only person that comes to mind is this supposed oh. girlfriend because she really seems to be a whack job. Mm -hmm. Like they call her the dragon lady. Mm -hmm. You know, she's she's this hostile, uh, somebody who you'd think could be that fatal attraction type person. Yes. Um, but that's just, I don't know the woman. So that's just me saying stuff that I hear. What Dennis Olin didn't know yet, but would soon find out, is that before he left this police interview room, he would be the prime suspect. When we come back, the search for the killer. Neighbors say it's the home of Dennis Olin, the son of prominent businessman Richard Olin. And the search for the motive. He brought this on, pushed you, pushed you, pushed you, squeezed you, rubbed your face in the fact that he controls it all. Businessman Richard Oland, known to friends as Dick, was found bludgeoned in his office in St. John, New Brunswick in July 2011, a pillar of one of the Maritimes' family dynasties. His death was ruled homicide. I would suggest to you that at, at the end of this investigation, we'll find that the, the perpetrator and the victim uh, knew each other. The police named no suspects, but it was soon clear who they had in mind. I'm standing here on Gondola Point Road in Rossay where St. John police are executing a search warrant. Neighbors say it's the home of Dennis Oland, the son of prominent businessman Richard Oland, who was found dead in his St. John office last Thursday. So Dennis Oland was squarely in their sights. But even as police scoured his house for hours, they wouldn't confirm what they were searching for, or even a connection to the killing. I can't say how long they're going to be here. They'll be here until, until they're done, basically. From the Tony suburb of Rothsick, the search expanded to another enclave unaccustomed to an armed police presence, the Yacht Club, where Dennis's wife Lisa moored her boat and where the family had been members for years. It all adds up to an unthinkable double tragedy for the Olins, according to neighbor and friend Kelly Patterson. It was such a brutal, vicious crime to somehow get your head around that while you're grieving the loss. Um, I think that's, that's a pretty tall order. And then right on the heels of that, you realize that one of your own is, you know, in the police's sights. Um, I think that's, to me, one of the real tragedies of this is that the family, I don't think, ever really had a, an opportunity to properly grieve the loss of their father, husband, grandfather. Increasingly, the St. John police would focus on the tension between Dennis Oland, then in his mid-40s, and his father, Dick. I first met uh, Dennis in, in uh, high school. A classmate and friend of Dennis, Dale Knox, acknowledges relations between the two deteriorated over the years. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I understand that. Um, you know, I, I think back to my own father, uh, who's been gone for a lot of years now, but um, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes those relationships are tough. It may have been tough growing up in the shadow of a father like Dick Olin, but friends say Dennis was trying to be his own man. Dennis uh, was not uh, one of those kids that uh, I think was handed everything to him. Larry Kane became a close pal, boating with Dennis, taking trips with their children, he says having to cope with a difficult dad built Dennis's character. He was expected to work hard, whether it was in the family business or when he started a career as a stockbroker, and, 
And uh, so Dennis worked for everything that he, that he earned. And, uh, and I think he learned that from his dad. Never part of Moosehead's inner sanctum. Dennis moved from New Brunswick to Toronto after university and began a career in finance. Back in St. John, he became a financial advisor with a major bank. His father, one of his clients. Dennis says where Dick's money was concerned, he was really just an order taker. And Dennis was, According uh, to Dale Knox, Dick Oland may have thought he was helping his son. His version of tough love. When you have conversations with your kids that sometimes aren't comfortable, uh, they, they think you're, you're being mean or, uh, or brutish maybe. Um, and of course, from the father's perspective, you think, well, no, I'm just, you know, giving you a life lesson and you should, you should learn because it's going to help you in, in, in future years. But the relationship between this father and son apparently was far beyond repair. When Dennis sits down with police constable Stephen Davidson the day after Dick was murdered, the discussion soon turns to the bad blood between them. You know, look, you just grew up in a family of really high expectations. Yes. Unrealistic expectations, he says, even at holiday gatherings. Everything is regimented. Yes. Okay, everything has to be perfect. Everything gets put down okay. and you're a waiter the whole time. Mm -hmm. And you're on your toes. And if something messes up, then, you know, you just... Worried. And so it's in those intense situations which were, were, where everything has to be perfect when mm -hmm. he can sort of, or, you know, would... Uh, you know, it wouldn't go over well. And Dennis unburdens himself with an account of one especially unpleasant Christmas. I certainly remember a Christmas dinner, not last year, it might have been two years ago, where he blew a gasket of something simple. You know when you, uh, you have a, a Christmas cake and you pour rum over, hot rum yes. over it, and you let it flame? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it was my job to do that in a flame for like 30 seconds and flamed out. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got it from the kitchen into the dining room, it flamed out. Well, it was a big fight over that. Okay. Yeah, it was, you know, it was not physical, but I mean, it was it was ugly. I, I, I might have left. But as time passes, Dennis stops responding. You and I have to talk here and have this conversation, okay? I need to know the reasons why. I want you to share that with me. His posture no longer relaxed, but defensive. Can you tell me what your reason is, Dennis? And though Constable Davidson keeps asking, Olin doesn't answer. After almost three hours, Davidson steps out of the interview room. I guess. And Constable Keith Copeland comes in, perhaps hoping a change in style might persuade Dennis Olin to open up again. I've been watching this interview since it started. Where Davidson was low key, even deferent, right away Copeland is in Dennis Olin's face. You didn't plan this, Dennis. He brought this on. Pushed you, pushed you, pushed you, squeezed you, rubbed your face in the fact that he controls it all. Disrespected you, disrespected your mother. The police officer insists that Dennis's money troubles and his father's affair had pushed him over the edge. And the truth is, your father was a mean son of a bitch. He controlled every penny that walked through that house. He disrespected your mother, didn't give her money, argued with her about where, how much she spent on groceries, made you pay your own way to go away with him. Did Dennis finally get sick and tired of being browbeaten and abused? Copeland keeps cajoling, berating, anything to insinuate himself into Olin's confidence. This was about ending the tyranny. I've had enough of this. You're not treating me like this anymore. Or maybe there was no conscious thought. Maybe it was just like, ah! Was it just a moment? But Dennis Oland has spoken to his lawyer. Once talkative, he now chooses to remain silent. I was told that I should call somebody. So I did. Yep, that's right. And you've exercised your rights to a lawyer. And, and we've that, that, given that, you that opportunity. That person yep. who I called said, just, you know, don't talk anymore. Mm -hmm. Please try and understand. Undaunted, Copeland keeps badgering him for another hour and 15 minutes. This is your opportunity, Dennis. At 11 p.m., after five hours of interrogation, there is a final question. 
Will you take advantage of that opportunity? Will you tell me what happened? It's a yes or no. No. We're done. The police are clearly convinced they've got their man, but without a confession, they don't have enough to hold him. When they leave the room, Dennis Oland walks out a free man. A free man, perhaps, but certainly not above suspicion. Eventually, in St. John, a city with a population of about 130,000, it seems everyone knew who was number one on the police most wanted list. Yet for 28 months after Dick Olin's body was found, the police publicly named no suspect and laid no charges. The St. John police held a news conference to assure the public they hadn't forgotten about the case. We're being methodical, our folks are being very methodical, and they're analyzing the information. We do not want to make a mistake. All the while, journalist Stephen Kimber says the identity of their suspect was an open secret. They thought that he knew the person who murdered him, but they wouldn't say it's Dennis Olin. So, so there was a lot of speculation, but at the same time, you know, they, they executed search warrants at his house, at the yacht club. It was hard for anybody not to realize that that's who was being investigated and that's who was the suspect. But according to friend Larry Kane, it was business as usual for Dennis Olin. Dennis was out in the community, he, did, he didn't hide. Wouldn't be unusual to run into him in the, in the grocery store or at, or at the market or, or in a restaurant. And um, you know, because I think Dennis had absolute faith and confidence in the justice system, as did his entire family. And for Dennis Olin, business might have been better than ever. After the murder, he was named co-executor of his father's estate and a trustee for his mother, paid a total of $150,000. He also became a director of his father's three companies and president of the main one. There's no indication of his compensation for those. Dick Oland was killed in St. John on July the 6th, 2011. His son Dennis interrogated the following day, but it wasn't until almost two and a half years later, November 2013, that the St. John police called this news conference. On Tuesday, November the 12th, 2013, members from the St. John police force arrested Dennis Olin, the son of Richard Olin, and charged him with second degree murder. After the break, the tale of the security tape, surveillance video of Dennis Olin the day his father was murdered. Why was Olin's silver car caught driving past his dad's office three times in seven minutes that evening? Why did he drive the wrong way up a one-way street? Why did he go in and out of Dick Olin's office three times, not long before the murder? When we return. Some called it New Brunswick's O.J. Simpson case. A combination of fame, money, and murder centered around the killing of one of the province's most powerful people, Richard O. But for some in St. John, there was the belief that family reputation and connections might trump justice. It is a very high-profile family, high-profile case. There was a lot of pretrial publicity. CBC reporter Bobby Jean McKinnon had covered the case for four years by the time it got to trial, which many were convinced they'd never see. I think there is a perception among a big group of the, the population that feel that, you know, money talks. And authorities worried they might not find enough impartial jurors to prosecute Dennis Olin for killing his father in a place where it seems everyone knew the family name and had an opinion about the case. It was the largest jury pool ever in New Brunswick, bigger even than such high-profile trials as Robert Picton in British Columbia, Paul Bernardo in Ontario, or Luca Magnata in Quebec. In all, 5,000 people were summoned for jury selection. So many came, they didn't hold it at the courthouse, but here at the St. John hockey rink. And though Dennis Oland was accused of brutally killing a family member, other Rollins came to his defense, writer Stephen Kimber. I think that other members of the family felt that Richard was being very hard 
on Dennis and were much more sympathetic toward him. And you see that playing out in after the murder when you, you have to ask yourself, you know, after the murder and Dennis is charged, who does the family rally around? Is it the dead father or is it the accused son? And, and to a person, it was the accused son. Finally, in the middle of September 2015, over four years after the murder, they came together for the trial. Dennis Oland and his wife Lisa, Connie Oland, mother of the defendant and wife of the victim. The prosecution, the defense, the family members and supporters who came to court each day. Kelly Patterson was one of them. They're private people being forced to endure a, a public trial and, um, you know, having your lives laid bare for the public to pick over, I think would be uncomfortable for most people to have strangers talking in the coffee shops and on the street corners about the private details of your life. But they showed up at court every single day with their heads held high to stand by Dennis and endure this, knowing what was coming, but they, they did it. Today we learn just how Richard Olin died. He suffered 46 blows to his body, six of them defensive wounds to his hands, the other 40 sharp and blunt injuries to his As head. As the trial opened, the prosecution would reveal the shocking details. His body was discovered face down in a pool of blood. And, and a case against Dennis Olin built around four main points of evidence. First and foremost, the visit Oland made to his father's office at number 52 Canterbury Street in downtown St. John on the evening of July 6, 2011. A typical day, he said, until that visit. It was after 5 p.m. when Dennis left his own office for his dad's. But the shot from this security camera shows he didn't go there directly. Instead, it captures the image of his silver Volkswagen circling the block before finally stopping on Canterbury Street in his father's parking lot. Dennis says he came to deliver research about Olin family history, material he carried in a red grocery bag. But then, apparently, the plan changed. And, and uh, went up the stairs and had my bag of stuff, and I forgot my stuff. Mm -hmm. well, some of my stuff, so I left. And but what he told the police about what happened was convoluted and confusing. He says after climbing to the second floor, realizing he'd forgotten something, he retraced his steps, returned to his car, and drove away. But he drove back to Canterbury Street. This time, he parked diagonally across from his father's office, as seen here in the upper right-hand corner. It was 5.25 p.m. He then crossed the street to number 52 and climbed the stairs to the second floor once again. This time, Dennis Olin says he stayed about 45 minutes. After he left, he's seen on the security footage at 6.12 p.m., still carrying the red bag. But it was only at the trial, four years later, that Dennis Olin admitted to a third visit that evening. After driving up Canterbury, turning the wrong way on a one-way street and parking, he then walked back to his father's office for that third time. He left a few minutes later and says only his father remained in the office. There's no evidence Dick Olin's computer or cell phone were used after that time. I might have gone... So Dennis is the last person known to see his father alive his muddled description of his comings and goings during that visit yeah, triggered the suspicion of the police. Watch here as the investigator leaves the room and Oland is left muttering to himself about what happened. I left there and I stopped there. Then what I left there. The question wasn't only where he went on the day of the murder, but also what he wore. And uh, what were you wearing? Because we, I just want to make sure. Dennis Olin's choice of sport jacket became a focal point for the police. Um, these pants, the shoes, a dress shirt, and a navy blazer. You were wearing 
They were, those, those pants, those shoes? Those shoes, a dress shirt, not this, a you know, collar dress shirt. Yeah. And a navy blazer. And a navy blazer. Yeah. Okay. The problem, police said, is that security cameras on the day his father was killed showed Dennis Oland wearing not a navy blazer, but a brown sport jacket, which was sent to be dry cleaned the very next day. Forensic analysis would find three small blood stains containing DNA that matched the profile of Dick Olin. The victim's blood would be another key to the prosecution case. And so would the victim's cell phone. When Dick Olin's body was found, it appeared not to be a robbery because he still had his valuables, wallet, Rolex watch, keys to the BMW. All that was missing was his cell phone. So where was it? According to Dennis Oland, after that visit to his father on July 6th, he went to this wharf near his home in the suburb of Rothsey, hoping to find his children who might be swimming there, he says. Each evening, Dick Oland spoke by cell phone to his longtime mistress, Diana Sedlicek. She left this message the day before. Hi, my love, it's 25 to seven. I'm on my way back to the house now. Catch you? Hello, Andy. All right. Yes, bye. On July 6th, she texted him at about the same time, 6.44 p.m. The text pinged off a cell tower, not in downtown St. John near Dick's office, but in Rothson, where Dennis claims he was looking for his kids. That tower is less than a kilometer away from the wharf, with only water in between. At trial, an expert testified it would be extremely unlikely if Dick Olin's cell phone weren't in that vicinity at that time. In other words, where Dennis Olin says he was, the phone was never found. There is no doubt the relationship between Dennis Olin and his father was a difficult one. But prosecutors went even farther, insisting the money issues between them were among the motives for murder. They described him as a man who was on the edge financially, that um, he owed his father more than half a million dollars, that his credit card and line of credit were maxed out. He basically bankrolled my whole... Yet speaking to the police, Dennis claims there is good news in the difficulties with his dad, the loan Dick gave him to save his house during a costly divorce. You know, at the end of the day, we were talking about, you know, a loan of five or six hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was grateful for it. So Dennis Holland admitted long-standing problems with his father, but said money wasn't among them. Though in fact, his finances appeared deeply troubled. Forensic accounting showed in addition to the more than half million borrowed from his father, he owed almost 164,000 on his line of credit. Over 31,000 on his credit card and he had taken a $16,000 advance on his salary. What's more, he had recently bounced a mortgage payment to his dad. Friends say it's not a side of Dennis. They knew. Were you aware that there were financial problems? No, um, you know, not particularly. Dennis was employed as a, as a financial advisor. And, uh, you know, when you're in that business, your earnings fluctuate depending on the state of the market and all kinds of other uh, economic conditions. Um, and, you know, I think at the end of the day that, um, you know, Dennis, uh, you know, had, had some debt, but, but he was managing. But in court, the prosecution revolved around Dennis's financial motive for murder. He was on the edge and, you know, people can do things you wouldn't expect them to do when they're when they have no other options nowhere else to turn the defense would tell a different story on july 6 2011 security cameras capture the rest of dennis olin's evening now in shorts and sandals at the drugstore with his wife at the market to buy samosas then a late night run to the irving gas station for milk are they the actions of a guilty man or of an innocent one going about everyday life when we come back? He went to public places after he left his father's office and there was no blood spatter on his shoes, on his pants, on his shirt, on anything, on his car, nothing.
It was one of the longest trials ever in New Brunswick. Prosecutors called over 40 witnesses, arguing Dennis Oland had a history of bitter disputes with his father that ended in murder. The defense had just three witnesses, including Dennis Oland himself. He denied there was an argument about his finances that day, or that he played any role in Dick Oland's death. Well-known criminal lawyer Alan Gold was brought from Toronto by the Olins to defend Dennis. Alongside veteran local lawyer Gary Miller, they were convinced there was reasonable doubt about the largely circumstantial prosecution case. For example, the central issue of the three blood drops on Dennis Olin's brown jacket. The defense asked, in such a gruesome crime, why wasn't there much more blood? Well, he went to pu public places after he left his father's office, and there was no blood spatter on his shoes, on his pants, on his shirt, on anything, on his car, nothing. Christopher Hicks is a defense lawyer in Toronto who's closely followed the Olin case. And you could not commit this terrible crime without getting blood on yourself. The experts said the same thing, and it just stands to common sense to 45 bludgeon and, and, and stab wounds. The defense claimed police did not properly control the crime scene, and there were other irregularities. Incredibly, for a couple of days after the murder, officers used Dick Olin's office bathroom before testing it for fingerprints, blood, or DNA. And Dennis's brown jacket was handled by an investigator without gloves, then left in a bag, folded for about four months before forensic testing. There now are two official inquiries into police conduct in this case. It was substandard uh, behavior by uh, forensic identification officers, and that's very important. So it raises lots of questions about uh, uh, the integrity of the crime scene and the integrity of the evidence they presented. The defense rested, confident it had poked serious holes in the prosecution's version of events. As the jury began deliberations, to Olin family and friends, it seemed just a matter of time until a not guilty verdict. That's how Larry Kane and Kelly Patterson felt. I didn't hear one thing through all of that that would shake my belief in, in his innocence. There was nothing. And in fact, what happened was day after day of the testimony, you realize, like, this is really ridiculous. Of course he's going to get off. That's exactly um, how we all felt. Uh, you know, he, uh, we, we expected to be at someone's home celebrating that night. The jury was out for a day, then two, then three, lulling the family into false hope, according to journalist Stephen Kimber. I certainly think that the longer they stayed out, there was a, an expectation that he was going to be found not guilty. He says the unknown factor was the impact the Olin family name might have on the jury. So I think this is, you know, going back to the Olins as uh, one of the, the, the establishment families, the elite families of New Brunswick, yeah, you sort of ask yourself, what's going through the minds of a jury when they're looking at this? You know, did he do it? Did somebody else do it? What, you know, what was really going on here? In all, the trial would last over three months, 65 days in court from September through December. It was just a few days before Christmas that the jury sent word to the judge that reached a verdict. The jury's verdict, Dennis Oland was found guilty of second degree murder. It was almost like all of the air got sucked right out of the room and, and then it sort of started to set in and, and somebody said, what? You know, and, and somebody else said, oh, they, they got it wrong. And, um, and he just started sobbing uh, wailing really uncontrollably and um, I mean I've covered a lot of court but it was unlike anything I've ever heard before it was it almost sounded like a, a wild wounded animal or something and uh, one of his lawyers Gary Miller went over to try and console him and you know he just sort of clutched onto his robes and was crying into his robes and he was saying oh no oh my god um, you know, and my children, and his wife was crying, and she ran out of the courtroom, and um, it was it was very emotional. 
and later that day we gathered at uh, Dennis's lawyer's house. You can start talking yeah. now. <laughs> um, anyway, we, we gathered, to, and it was, uh, you know, we were in a fog, totally stunned. I mean, it was surreal. You couldn't really grasp that this had really happened. We were in shock for several days. You know, it, it took, still. and still, you know, <laughs> it, it, you just can't process it. St. John, with its division between the elite and the others, was now also a city divided by the trial and the verdict. I really think that there's a division out there. I really do. I think people uh, are very divided on this issue. And I think even some people who believe he is guilty uh, do not feel that justice has been served because they didn't feel there was enough presented during the trial to convict him. One month after Dennis Oland was convicted, his lawyers filed an appeal, claiming the guilty verdict should be quashed, saying the judge had made multiple errors in instructing the jury and also by admitting certain evidence. Notably, that brown jacket Oland was wearing the day his father was killed. The appeal maintains the warrant police used to search Oland's home covered finding the jacket but not forensic testing afterwards. They say that should have required a second warrant, and therefore the DNA results tying Dennis's blazer to Dick's blood are inadmissible. That's what that reasonable, unreasonable search and seizure clause in the charter is for, I think, and that's, that's a really good example. Yeah. It allowed them to seize the, the, enter the property and seize the coat, but it didn't authorize them to do anything else with it. Which sounds like a loophole. Well, you know, it's, it sounds like short-sightedness to me on the part of the prosecution. When he was found guilty, Dennis Olin's wife and mother issued a statement telling the people of St. John they believe the real killer remains at large. But at his sentencing in February 2016, the judge saw things differently, describing Dick Olin as a very difficult man who caused dysfunction in his family, and Dennis as someone who on July 6, 2011, simply exploded. Dennis Oland was sentenced to life in prison with no parole for a minimum of 10 years, refused bail while awaiting his appeal. It is all a sad chapter in the Oland family saga, what the judge called a Shakespearean tragedy about a father and son, each in the end, it seems, responsible for his own demise. <laughs>